Welcome to the Curious Cuenca podcast by Yappa Tree. I'm so excited to share this project with you. It's a concept that has been rolling around in the back of my head for several years, and it's finally coming to fruition. The general concept is quite simple. Curious Cuenca is a video podcast where we interview interesting people from various walks of life who live in Cuenca, Ecuador. Guests include new and old expats, businesses, interesting locals, and Cuenca-based non-profit organizations. These non-profits also play a key role in the podcast as we allow you to donate to them. There are a lot of deserving charities in Cuenca that struggle a little bit with marketing. Well, let's be honest, they all struggle a lot. And many of our audience members are in the process of moving to Cuenca and they are looking for ways that they can contribute to their new home to be. This gives them an opportunity to start making a difference before they arrive. Now, we're certainly not trying to profit off your donations. 100% minus any PayPal fee is donated once we hit the target threshold. And we're starting this threshold at $500. Hopefully it doesn't take us long to get there. And with your support, I'm sure that we can. And what is my motivation? Well, that's twofold. Firstly, as a content creator, I think this is the way that I can have the greatest impact in helping these nonprofits. Secondly, I am super curious by nature and this podcast series gives me an excuse to talk to interesting people that I would otherwise probably not cross paths with. You could say that this podcast series is the next iteration in my Cuenca journey. It represents a substantial change for me and I have to say I've gone through a bunch of different changes since being in Ecuador and in particular Cuenca. Which brings us to today's topic, reinventing yourself in Cuenca. It brings me great pleasure to welcome the very first guest of the Curious Cuenca podcast, Jeff Shinsky. You may know Jeff from his Facebook group, Expats Without Agendas, or from playing in his band, Northern Roots, or from one of the other myriad of activities that Jeff seems to have taken up throughout his retirement in Cuenca. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks a million for being here. The, the very first question is just the basics. How mm -hmm. long have you been in Cuenca and why did you choose Cuenca as your destination? Uh, I just passed my 10-year anniversary on the 1st of February. Um, I, I came down in December of 2013, and uh, within two months, I had sold most of my possessions and uh, had come down to Cuenca to live. And, um, and what, what was the spark about Cuenca? Well, I had seen an episode of House Hunters International <laughs> <laughs> with a Canadian couple uh, who are no longer here, but... Uh, uh, they were they were looking at apartments and uh, other properties, you know, 500, 600 a month for these large, uh, you know, really nice places. And and here I was in Denver paying sixteen hundred dollars a month for a small two bedroom apartment, um, average of three hundred a month for utilities, um, uh, you know, cell phone plans and cable TV plan. Everything costs more there. And when I saw how much. You know, they were talking about the the the, uh, the cost of living here. I you know, I put that I put it in the back of my mind. I was still I wasn't ready, quite ready to move here yet, but uh, but it, it's it stayed there in the back of my mind. So it was the cost of living that uh, it, that initial spark was like, hey, I can live in in Ecuador, and it's going to be like half as what you were considering in the U.S. Or when you were oh, doing the math, what did it end up looking like? It looked more like about a third actually, and. And I didn't just come here as an economic <laughs> refugee like 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 uh, I, I know some people have. I mean, I I looked at it as you know I was you know I have a sense of adventure, so you know it just seemed like something to be fun to do. Yeah, fantastic. And the article on reinventing yourself in Cuenca, it is fantastic. It's very detailed. So thank you very much for for writing that. Well, thank you. And it is very personal, and mm -hmm. I do appreciate that as well. And why? What inspired you to? write you know such a such a personal account or, or share with others your personal account well the main thing is that my life has changed so much from what it used to be before i came here i was i was very much an anonymous person i pretty much kept to myself uh i'm a, I'm a hardcore you know almost off the scales introvert so um but my life here has changed so much it's opened up in so many different ways and i've gotten into other activities met so many other people uh have uh, you know, learning the language here, uh, 
uh, getting involved in, in so many of the things that I have. I, I just wanted to show people that, that there were options here. Uh, Quink is a good place to get out and do things and find things to do. Um, you know, whether it's at, uh, at ADMR taking a class on, uh, you know, watercolor or, 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 or whatever it is. There's just so much that, that people can do here. And I just kind of wanted to, to share that. I, I mean, I went from some, someone who was, uh, who did almost nothing outside the house to, um, uh, someone who's branched out in a lot of different ways. And I just wanted to share that with people and let them know that was a possibility. I think it is a great testament to the, the possibilities out there. And this theme is something that I personally come across all the time. You know, every expat that comes here, they're like, how am I going to spend my time? Well, of course, you can spend it however you've been spending it in the States. But this is a really good time to, to actually think how, what do you want your, your life to be? And mm -hmm. So I think for me, that's probably one of the main messages is, yeah, you can effectively come to Cuenca, embrace the change and there's a lot of opportunities that are available to you exactly but i think the point is they're not going to chase you no and and this is something that that you um i mentioned in the article is that you had to put yourself out there and especially as as an introvert i, I imagine that was actually quite difficult to, to put yourself out there especially those initial steps can you can you walk me through some of those initial steps that helped get yourself out there well one was um I'm I'm not very good with boredom, <laughs> uh, so uh, as I didn't speak Spanish yet at the time, at least I mean I could speak a few words, but a few, few phrases, but but essentially, uh, and I was alone. I came here by myself, and um, I started feeling kind of isolated. So I started looking for things to do, and that just kind of naturally led to you know picking up one hobby, then another hobby. Uh, you know, some of those hobbies became permanent passions. Some of them became, you know, just something that I did temporary. I enjoyed it for a while and then I moved on. So you just didn't want to sit inside watching TV all day. And I know that's the tempting for, for some expats because it's mm -hmm. the easy option. Mm -hmm. um, and so moving along to some of the, the more cultural side of things and a lot of expats, especially, you know, our office, this studio, it's in El Centro. It, it has the romantic feel and everyone that comes to, to Cuenca, I think it's fair to say that one of the initial attractions is the, the cultural diversity mm -hmm. and, and my question to you is how has that helped to, to reshape the the identity that you now have in Cuenca the, the cultural experiences that you've had here well I, I I have lived abroad before I spent 20 years in the US Air Force and lived in uh, two other countries um, fortunately people there spoke English so I didn't have to learn another language but um, um, but yeah, have, you know, having to learn the language here. Well, I didn't. I didn't have to. You know, it's. It, you know, a lot of people don't. <laughs> but, but but you felt you you needed to. Yeah, I, I feel like if you're going to live in another country, it's if if you really want to experience to experience it to its fullest, you need to be able to communicate with the people around you. And you know, I didn't want to rely on on facilitators and other translators for everything I do, and so. You mentioned in, in the in the article uh, about basically becoming part of an Ecuadorian family, mm -hmm. and I can definitely relate to that. And there is a there's a lot of learnings. It's not always easy, <laughs> but it is it does add, add a, a whole different dimension to, to the time mm -hmm. here. And so, I would love if you can just walk me through some of the the joys, but also some of the challenges on the other side that you have personally experienced from this. Yeah. Well, one of the immediate challenges was being able to understand all the slang that my three, uh, my three new daughters <laughs> spoke. Uh, I still have, I still have problems sometimes understand people under 30 here. Yeah, they're but, uh, Yes. Yep. Well, uh, my wife is originally from Puerto Viejo and, uh, and two of, uh, is that coastal, you know, slang and stuff like that present in, in your wife? Uh, after she speaks to her mother or sister on the phones, uh, the, the Manaba and, and her comes out and she starts speaking what I call Chino. And, <laughs> and so I have to remind her to, you know, to switch back to, she's lived in Cuenca for, for well over 20 years. So she can, she, she can speak either, <laughs> uh, coastal or Sierra Spanish. Uh, and, um, but, um, uh, some of the other challenges were um i mean they just do things a lot differently there's a lot of 
uh, and, and and not ne not necessarily in a bad way. I mean, there's a big focus on family and friends, and um, and I've learned a lot from them. Like uh, like for instance, in the U.S., you don't walk into a bank or walk out of a bank and say thank you to the security guard holding <laughs> holding a shotgun. But uh, when I noticed that my wife was, you know, she she say hello and goodbye and thank you to everybody and. And I didn't really realize how important that was here. It's really part of the culture, and and uh, and I found from you know from speaking to some Ecuadorians that they consider they consider a lot of the expats to be rude or dismissive because they don't do those things. And so that was a really important lesson for me here, and a, and a bit of a challenge because because of my introversion, I'm not naturally outgoing in that in that way. But um, but uh, in, in terms of you know some of the the, the joys of being in an Ecuadorian family is um, I don't think I've washed more than a couple of dishes in the last <laughs> seven years. They won't let me do anything for myself. So um, uh, to say that they take good care of me would be an understatement. So uh, and, and sometimes that can be frustrating because I'm, I'm a, I was a fairly independent person. I was single for eight years before I got here and and uh so while i i still mourn my uh the loss of my independence to a certain degree uh, uh you know that uh, being part of a loving family makes up for for a lot of that there's a huge advantage there the um uh, michelle's mother is living with us at the moment mm -hmm. so she's very much taken on you know what you're talking about you know like she'll just go to the kitchen make food make sure no one in the house is hungry and probably some of the neighbors as well. So mm -hmm. it is it is a lot of fun for me. Let's move on to your Facebook group, Expats Without Agendas, because mm -hmm. uh, I can definitely relate to that. Uh, we we started our Facebook group for a very similar reason. It was the current landscape wasn't necessarily fulfilling the needs, what we thought of, of the expats here. Um, now things have changed a lot since, since we started our group and even more so I imagine since you started your group because your group's out of the, older than, than ours. Mm -hmm. And so my, my question is, how do you feel about the current landscape of the, the the myriad Facebook groups that exist specifically to help expats here in, in Cuenca? Well, for one thing, uh, I feel like there's a lot of duplication of effort. <laughs> there, there, there. Are, uh, when I first got here, there was two or three other kind of general expat groups. Now I, I can't even count them. There's so many. Um, I'm, I mean, the I'm, barrier to entry is so low. Anyone can just two seconds, new group. Right, right. Um, and I guess, how do you feel about the quality of information in those groups? And uh, I guess, are there any limitations at the moment that, that you see? Well, th th there are limitations in all the groups, really, including mine. Um, I mean, as an active admin in the group, I try to make sure that any information given out is accurate. And that um, that's tough and very time-consuming. It, it, it is tough, especially if somebody else uh, in your group, you know, gives out some some bad information. You know, you have to figure out a diplomatic way to, to try to correct that. And and uh, um, but but I have seen in other groups um, uh, some that I've been kicked out <laughs> because um, uh, they were giving out bad information, like on uh, rental law and. Um, different cultural things and um so i i find that frustrating when i when i visit those other groups i see i see you know and some of the information given out is just not accurate and uh and that may be based on perhaps one experience with with one facilitator or um or one one doctor or one hospital or one insurance company but uh um that, that can be tough to balance though because you know obviously everyone has an opinion everyone's opinion you know is valid but if you only have a sample size of you know one <laughs> then that's kind of tough to to really put a lot of weight behind that but i guess that's something that that can get missed mm -hmm. sometimes is you know what is the, the sample size and, and stuff like mm -hmm. that so i think there are some limitations and especially when with the misinformation that, yeah. that does exist out there but at the same time i also think they act as a really good starting point and yeah. so like i would not suggest anyone to, to base their decision solely on you know untrusted refer mm -hmm. unknown referrals yeah. in, in in many instances but at least it's going to give you somewhere to start with so i yeah. think there's value there well I'm, I'm i'm a fairly active admin and in, in that i you know i do look at the information that people are posting and i you know 
you know, do as much fact checking as I can and as much damage control as I can. <laughs> right, right. Um, but uh, one of the things I do is I, I preemptively write a lot of articles or just you know different posts to to get information out there and try and try try and get some good information out there to start with so that people have something to work with. So Jeff, I do understand to some degree the amount of effort that goes into moderating some of these Facebook groups, the amount of mediation that you end up doing, uh, you know, between members. Uh, I don't think uh, a lot of people really understand how much time and how many man hours are spent on mm -hmm. moderating these groups. And so the question for me is why? You know, what does Jeff get out of it? And also, I'm going to assume that it just helps enhance your sense of community here. And my question then is how does it enhance the sense of community? Well, I've come to 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 meet and know a lot of these people, made a lot of friends. Um, uh, and I do also want to do a shout out to uh, my admin team. I have three other people who help me a lot, so that's that's very important for any any larger group. But uh, I mean, what I get out of it is uh, I'm I'm. I'm kind of a compulsive helper I'm from, you know, it's kind of based on my 25 years in adult education. I just, uh, I, I enjoy sharing information things that I know that will help. I really, the overdriving thing was I, I wanted a group that would help expats be, become more successful expats. Um, you know, not make a lot of the mistakes that I made. So, uh, so, you know, a lot of my posts end up being me relating something that I did that I shouldn't have done or I wish, I, or wish I had done differently. Seriously. So, so uh, it's, you know, I, I like to think that it's helpful, but at the same time, you know, there's a, there's a certain personal sense of satisfaction knowing that uh, you're providing a useful service to others. No, it definitely helps with that purpose hitch. Mm -hmm. So moving on now to your experience as a, a rental agent here, that's mm -hmm. obviously something we have a, a lot of crossover with. Mm -hmm. we, we do a lot of rentals here at Yapa Tree. Um, so what I would love to know first is what were the main lessons that you'd learned throughout your time as a rental agent here in Cuenca? And just to be clear, you're no longer offering this service. No, right? no, no. Um, well, for one thing, it's it's very different from renting in the U.S., you know, where they have these standardized contracts that you just sign without reading. Here, you really have to read the lease. Uh, um, uh, one thing I found out was that most of the time when a rental agent is working for the owner, the, the agent supplies the lease. And um, um, I've spent a lot of my time rewriting leases and, and making them fair to, to both parties. But... Uh, and actually, one of the things that I, uh, this is kind of a maxim of mine, it's not 100% true, but but uh, I like to think that there are no bad landlords, just bad leases, because <laughs> it's, it, you know, which isn't really true. There are bad la landlords out there, but... Uh, but if you don't start off on the right foot right, with a good lease. Right, a good lease is what insulates you from, from uh, some of the... It's some, some uh, of one of our big learnings is expectation setting is probably the most important part of mm -hmm. where a lot of agents just don't do a particularly good job with mm -hmm. the with the tenants and and with the landlords too. Mm -hmm. um, that's the other side of the equation that a lot of expats don't necessarily see, um, but it's it's not necessarily easy on the landlord side because they have their expectations as well, mm -hmm. and so you're really trying to to manage those. How? Did you deal with that side of things, dealing with the landlords in particular? Because I know that your Spanish is, is, is very good, but still, I'm assuming at the time, there was still a little bit of a gap. Or Can you just walk me through that? Well, my Spanish is fair. <laughs> it's, it's decent. Anyway, um, uh, well, it was a gringo working with a Venezuelan partner. Um, and... You know, the Venezuelans have a bit of a challenge here being accepted by, by the local people. And so you can imagine, you know, a gringo and a Venezolana showing up at your door and say, do you mind if we list your house? <laughs> I think it's with a, a Colombian as well. And, yeah. And they're not immune uh, from the same challenges sometimes. Uh, yes. Uh, that that was more of a part-time thing. But my regular partner was was, was Venezuelan. And uh, one time we actually got run off the property by an old man who oh, wow. didn't like expats or or Venezuelans. I mean, he, he literally run us off the property. <laughs> And said, don't come back, you know, so, but, um, but in general, did you find landlords were, were workable or did you just find that there was some certain key challenges that just kept coming up and up? Well, uh, 
of, of course they they're not always keen on paying a commission for uh, for the help but 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 a lot of them do realize the value of having someone promoting their property and uh, and are more than happy to do that so um uh, i mean the biggest challenge really was was just finding the properties to list and and um and uh very very manual Right. right. Is that your experiences as well? Yes, very manual. Spent a lot of, lot of, lot of time uh, driving around, walking around, looking for properties. Um, so yeah, it was, it, it was, it was pretty time labor intensive. Yeah, absolutely. We we call it pounding the pavement, and, right. and it really is. I I do know Jeff as well that you've spent a lot of time studying the various neighborhoods. You've pulled together the map on of Quenca neighborhoods, which mm -hmm. we've used a lot at Yapa Tree. So thanks for that great mm -hmm. resource. Uh, but my question is really, what's your advice on choosing a particular neighborhood for for newer expats? One of the one of the most important things that that seem to be an issue for expats here are is noise, and and knowing what to look for um, and and what to look out for. Uh, Things like, um, you know, if you're upstairs in a house that you're considering renting, you want to look out the window and see who's next door. It might be a machine shop or a, a cooey ranch <laughs> or something like that. Uh, some friends of mine actually moved into a place where there was an empty storefront and they, they thought, oh, this is a nice quiet area until they until they started having uh, uh, cockfights there on, on Friday and Saturday nights. So... Uh, so uh, noise bit, issues is a, is so a those big one. hidden noise issues are, right. are, the, are the tough ones, especially right. like you think somewhere could be really nice, right? Like, like living next to a park that has bilaterapia either that's, early that's in the morning <laughs> or late at night. That's that's a big issue. Uh, yep. Some types of churches, uh, different schools, um, uh, living next to or across from a vacant lot can be uh, a, a big wake up. Uh, uh, you know, suddenly they start building. Like you, I, I know people who have who've bought very nice condos, and then in the vacant lot across the street, they built a taller one. So suddenly they have no view anymore. Same. So I tell people avoid vacant lots. You know, because you know they're not going to stay empty for very long. It's also important how big that lot is as well. And so this sure. is something that we 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 come up with a lot. And so some lots obviously you can do certain amount on, mm -hmm. but. For example, to have a big building, you need a certain size lot in mm -hmm. order for, for that to happen. So I completely agree, but at the same time, I'd probably take that a little bit st a step further mm -hmm. and just be you know really clear on what is possible to be built in mm -hmm. this certain neighborhood, just yeah. so you've got some sort of idea as to what to expect mm -hmm. potentially in, in the future. Um, and I've personally found uh, like operating at the rental business, there's a lot of challenges here, mm -hmm. um, a bunch of different different challenges some cultural, m many cultural, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably been my, my, my biggest challenge. Um, I'm very much interested in the challenges that you faced and whether or not you'd actually recommend going down this path of you know, potentially being a, a rental agent here in, in Cuenca. Uh, in a word, no. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't re I wouldn't recommend it to any expat, really, uh, and, unless, unless they just needed the income, uh -huh. which was my case. I... I I came down here with enough uh, of an income to support one person, and then all of a sudden I was in a family of five. So I had to look for some way to supplement that income. But, but um, there are some expats, and this is the question that we're answering really, is if you need to generate some sort of income here, is this a path that, that you would su suggest? And we, we do come across this a, a little bit. It's 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 certainly, if, if, as long as you have a decent level of Spanish, it's and, and you understand the rental laws and, and uh, have a pretty good feel for cultural differences here and how to approach people um, because approaches can be very, very important. Um, I, I refer to it as the dance, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you, you need to, you know, there needs to be some compliments. There needs to be some building That's what you're up. talking about before with the introductions and making sure they're always proper. Right, like right. All of that's extremely important. So, you know, for somebody who uh, is, is up for that challenge, it, uh, it it can be an interesting job. <laughs> um, I, I won't say I didn't enjoy it, but it, it was it was challenging at times. Um, you know, sometimes you have a client that just uh, doesn't like anything, and 
you know, showing them 20 different apartments. And right. Nothing. Well, if I wish the light was a foot over this way or the, the yeah, bat, the, yeah. the tile on the bathroom was a different color. So, yeah. And especially in the rental market, it moves so quick that mm -hmm. if you don't have a yes, pretty much straight away, then that, that apartment's going to go. Right. And then you're back at square one mm -hmm. with properties that maybe instead of nine out of 10 boxes, tick seven out of 10. Right. So we, we always suggest um, to, to people, if you find a place and it's, it's going to work for you, you do need to act relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. Don't take the first property that, that comes to you. Mm -hmm. But if you do like a property, chances are next time, you know, give it a couple of days. If it's mm -hmm. a good property, it's just not going to be there. That, that's the reality of the rental market right now. Yeah. I'm not saying it's always going to, to be like that. Um, but moving on to some of the, the personal side of things, and I know a little bit about um, uh, some of the health issues you had especially moving away from Cuenca. Mm -hmm. You spent a bunch of time in Manta mm -hmm. you know, predominantly for that. Can you just walk me through how you managed to overcome some of those health issues? Because, you know, a, a lot of expats move here that they do have similar issues yeah. as well. Well, uh, for one, I've not exactly overcome all of them You're yet. still there with the, the COVID? Uh, yes, I, uh, yes I, uh, I, I got COVID about 20 months ago. Um, and... Um, and I've had uh, long COVID since then. And then I got COVID again just about two months ago and, and um, that didn't help matters. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, I, it just, just in those past 20 months, you know, I've had COVID twice, dengue fever once from a uh, mosquito bite down in Manta, um, torn hamstring, um, uh, developed a lot of different issues related to the long COVID. Uh, um, and, and, and just about two weeks ago, I had, I had prostate surgery, which, you know, I mean, that's, oh, well, that's kind of personal, but, um, but I wrote, I wrote up the whole story of my expat page because, uh, you know, these are issues that men of a certain age need to be aware of. of and, and, uh, again, I like, uh, I like to put, put the word out there so people don't make the same mistakes I did. You know, I mean, I was told. Oh, maybe a year and a half ago. Well, your prostate's a little enlarged, and someday you may need surgery too. Oh, your prostate's eight times or four times the normal size. Quite, quite it needs, the difference. Huh? It needs to come out right now. Yeah. Uh, so, um, in the space of a year and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, so you so know, get, to get those checks is basically what you're saying, right? I, I, you know, I, I don't want to see somebody else have major health problems because. You know, I didn't share what I know about it. So I, yeah. I just, you know, again, that's part of the the, the, the educator in me that uh, that likes to get the word out and, and, and help people not make mistakes that I made or... or... How, how much of an impact has your family had on this and just, you know, helping throughout this, this period? Um, well, they've been incredibly supportive. Um, I mean, I honestly don't know how I would have gotten by without... Um, without the help of my family. I mean, I, uh, the times I've been in the hospital, my, my, my wife stays there the entire time. And, um, uh, so and I've also, I've also gotten a lot of uh, incredible support from a local expat community too. Uh, right. uh, the, the level of caring and generosity here in the expat community is, is, is far above anything I ever experienced in the U S and it's, um, it's, it's pretty. It's just. It's a special thing here, and I mean, I can't go into a lot of detail, but I've. But I've had. I've gotten a lot of help from local expats here. Awesome, and in, in just in terms of the the integration side of things, how exactly how important do you think learning the Spanish is? Like, do you think it's possible to properly integrate, um, especially culturally, if uh, you come here and you know you, you basically have Spanish lights, or you know you're basically making an active decision not to learn Spanish, how much is that likely to impact someone? Well, the, the example I always give is, you know, what if you're at the mall and you collapse and you can't tell the people standing around you, uh, my heart pills are in my backpack <laughs> you know, or, or I'm diabetic and, and I need, I need some glucose or, uh, um, that's actually something I experienced at Supermax. once a woman had, uh, an expat woman had collapsed and there were like 20 people around her trying to help her and figure out what was wrong. And, and they were all saying, well, I think it's this, or I think it's that. And I, I came up there and she says, she says, I'm diabetic. And I, you know, I, I my glucose went too low and I just collapsed. And so, and I was able to help in that situation but it's it's 
But that's uh, more like so you're basically saying like not yeah obviously it's going to enhance your life but it can also if if you don't even have know the basics it can actually be quite detrimental and, and really quite dangerous in certain circumstances right right um but in terms of enhancing your life i, I mean just just one uh I, I mean it seems like a tiny thing but i used to go to this one shop to buy printer cartridges when i first got here and i wasn't speaking hardly any spanish at the time and the first time i went in and and worked the courage to ask for the same cartridge in spanish uh they sold it to me for like five dollars cheaper than they normally oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh and so just being able to use spanish to negotiate prices or uh is is a big thing here um getting to, I, I mean it's i mean language is culture i mean you can't really separate the two so if if you don't know at least you know at least maybe a lower intermediate level of spanish you're never really going to f fully integrate into the culture here and uh, and uh, i do know a lot of people who've left because they just didn't feel uh like they just couldn't get over that yeah they, right they just they just didn't feel like they fit in yeah. so yeah, yeah, yeah well, that's interesting so yeah we don't want to beat down like you have to learn spanish and, and everything everyone's free to make their own decisions but i do think it's good to know that this is the, the likelihood you're only going to get so far if you are actively making that decision not, right. not to learn spanish yeah whether, whether to learn it or not that you're gonna you know this is a, it's a personal decision and you know and those who you know there, there are a lot of people believe they're too old to learn which uh you know i i, I know that's not <laughs> necessarily true not true but uh, it, it does get harder it, it has though. it does it does get harder as you get older um but you know it's, it's easy to use that as an excuse as well I yeah but i would say that at a minimum people should at least learn what um what i would refer to as survival spanish you know to the things that you need to do to, to do daily business uh, uh to address medical issues that you may have things like that and i think that's pretty much achievable for most people though like yeah. that level of, of survival spanish mm -hmm. is attainable um so moving on to some of the other things i, I really like uh, just the variety of different activities um, that, that you've basically been keeping yourself busy with and I'm, I'm a little bit the same you know like pottering around different things uh, one of the ones in particular I enjoyed was the bonsai yeah. and uh, my mom growing up my mum was obsessed with <laughs> the bonsais absolutely loved them and I would always see her you know fussing and finessing and it was a lot it was a, a huge commitment and she loved it until the day that someone stole all of her bonsais mm. and then obviously you know she, she left it oh. but it sounds like you enjoyed it but you basically stopped because it was just too difficult to to keep them alive ultimately <laughs> well i mean that was an issue I, I i definitely have more that have died than are still alive <laughs> but uh i mean uh, bonsais are very particular they get they get accustomed to a particular space a certain amount of water a certain amount of light and and if you suddenly change things on them uh i mean uh, the way you have to create them and the way the root system is they're just they're just extremely delicate so so any changes uh and they tend to react badly and because i moved a number of times and i would take the plants with me i'd lose two or three every time <laughs> did you take some demanta with you no, no no i didn't i didn't take any plants uh down there but um it, it, but i didn't really quit because i you know because they were dying on me it was more uh I, I, it had kind of run its course. I wanted to move on to different things, but there was also the issue of, of the pricing of the plants. Uh, you used to be able to go to a nursery and you pick up a small plant that looks like, yeah, that's got bonsai potential, and it costs 2 or $3. And, uh -huh. and then, then suddenly all the nurseries caught on, and, and now those same plants were costing 10 and $12. And um, so, so I, I just got to the point where it... it, it you didn't want to pay four times what no you were paying for. no and 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 again i was ready to move on to other yeah, things okay. i had i that was right about the time that uh, i got married and had a new family so um i had to start focusing on other things have you visited the neon neighborhood in quito just outside of quito no i haven't ne next time you go to quito check it out i know you're not really into bonsais anymore but i'm oh. sure you'll appreciate the variety and and the the prices there too 
it's a really really quality prices yeah. we we go there quite a bit every time we're in Quito. though yeah there's a, there's actually a place on diaz de agosto close to etapa that uh, it's a it's a bonsai shop they have a lot of bonsais there for sale and the prices are, are, are fairly decent and they have a lot of supplies for people who want to get into that hobby so yep. there is a little bonsai club here i believe but i think it's only in spanish do you know of any I, I I've heard of it. I, I and I know that they've had some big shows and things here, but I I never attended any of them. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I I still you know love the bonsai. I still have a few of them, but um, but you know I just have other things that occupy my time now. So. What, what about orchids? Have you moved on to orchids at all? No, I haven't gotten that brave yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm the same. I love them though. I mean, you know, that's you know, I've been to that shop down by Gualaseo where where they have all the orchids. It's they're, they're beautiful. Go check out um, Uzaput Gardens. So though the same owners from Ecuador, mm. they're now owning Uzaput Gardens and. So there's just orchids everywhere there. It, mm. is, it is amazing, and mm -hmm. it's great to see what the possibilities are. Of course, when we take those plants home, mm -hmm. they, they, they don't tend to survive as, as long or thrive mm. in the same way, but that's a challenge that we're working on too. Yeah. One of the other things that I really enjoyed uh, was you have this mentality of fixing as opposed to throwing away and buying new and that's that very much fits with the, the Quincano way of life and, and I, I really like that um how what what got you into that and i guess why do you continue to, to do that because uh, i know we don't have amazon here now but it's got a lot easier mm -hmm. to, to, to purchase a lot of the, the little creature comforts that right. you may like mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one was just seeing how how they do it here. I mean, you go into Supermaxi and Corral, and there's a whole aisle of of blender parts, <laughs> you know. And and if if you walk around El Centro, there's shops to fix pretty much anything. Or you go to La Rapida with a pair of old beaten up, uh, practically destroyed uh, uh, running shoes, and they can they can make them almost new again. Uh, so that was that was kind of partly my inspiration and then the rest of it was just necessity um uh you know when i'm back in the states i go to home depot or lowe's and i go through those gray metal drawers where they have all the tiny bits of specialized hardware that you can't find here and i bring a lot of that back with me so i can use it for different projects or re repairing different things but um yeah, you know, and the, the quality of of goods here is not that great uh a lot of them are imported from places where quality is not all that important um, you know mic microphone stands for instance I, I can't tell you how many microphone stands I've repaired for my, either for myself or for other people um, because they, 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 they tend to last about three months and then they fall apart yeah. so um, but uh, yeah I mean there's a certain level of satisfaction taking something that's yeah, broken well, what's and, giving you the most satisfaction is there you know one little project or you know one repair job that, that you've done that you're like wow I've, I've surprised myself here well, pretty much all of them, I would say. I've been, you know, they, it's it's always a huge sense of satisfaction to say, you know, to take something that's not functional, and making it functional again, and um, yeah, that's just that's just something I've always enjoyed. But I, I I never did it anywhere near the level, you know, like like the little ten dollars shopping carts you buy at Corral. The wheels fall off of those after a couple of months, but I I found a way to fix those, and you know, it's it's. Yeah, it's just personally satisfying being able to to do that. What about your walking sticks? Are you still manufacturing those or? Uh, you with those? No, that was that was kind of a passing fancy too. I, I did those for a while and uh, and uh, sold some, still have some, but uh, um, you know when I when I go hiking, I I I need one as like a third leg <laughs> to <laughs> help me keep my balance and keep me from falling down the hill. But that, you know that was. That was that was fun while it lasted, but it was you know again I I decided just to move on to other things. So. Awesome, and just moving on a little bit. So uh, I don't want to beat the introvert thing to death, but that is a, is a key challenge. And my my question really is, you've you started off as an introvert. I mean, you're still an introverted person, but you were very much guarded towards keeping your anonymity at one mm -hmm. point. But now you basically have a seem to say you know let the floodgates open. Yeah, and I guess what change internally ha has occurred throughout that process? Like, how do you now perceive yourself now that you're, I guess, less anonymous? Well, 
the anonymity thing was wasn't really so much of a choice as just kind of a, a natural um, a natural aspect of being yeah. being an introvert uh, and, and it's not that we don't like people we're just a little more selective about people that we decide to hang out with and 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 we we, we have difficulty um, maintaining too many connections at once so so we tend to keep our circle of friends you know close friends I should say small I mean I have I have, I have a lot of friends here but but uh, you know in terms of really close friends you know that that's that's a fairly small circle but uh, I wouldn't say that um, my introversion has really changed here I'm, I'm still the same person but I, I one thing I do to, to cope is I compartmentalize like for instance if I'm at trivia and there's uh, at common grounds um, you know there may be 60 or 70 other people in the room but uh, I'm only focused on the three other people on my team you know everything else is just kind of background noise so um, is that the same when you're performing in the band because exactly. that, that seems to be next level in, in terms of a challenge exactly uh, I, I, I tend to uh, you know, I'm focusing on the band, focusing on the music. Uh, I mean, I'm aware there's an audience there, and I do get uh, pre-show jitters like anybody else. But um, but once we get going, it's all about the music. So, and you know, focusing on each other in the band, making sure we're you know we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And we we also have a, a fairly dedicated core fans that come to our shows so so it's almost kind of like a family reunion it's not it's not that intimidating so yeah, yeah. And, and you have been in multiple bands throughout your, your time here how has that whole process you know being in, in different bands um would you say that, that that really helped you overcome you know some of the, some of the cultural um difficulties which which everyone faces when, when we come here because your first band for example i know was uh, it was was it two three Ecuadorians that, that you were playing? With? Oh yeah, that was about <laughs> it was about six six or eight months after I got here. I yeah. had I had uh, just purchased a pair of bongos and a pair of congas, and uh, an Ecuadorian an Ecuadorian band was looking for a percussionist, and they put the ad in English uh, in in Gringo Post, and I contacted the guy, and and next thing I knew, I was out in CIUC uh, practicing with them. Um, but uh, they couldn't get or keep a vocalist, so the band ended up folding after a while. But it, but it was fun, you know. I mean, I, it was my first real kind of immersion experience in, in Ecuadorian culture, so it was. Uh, and, and, and looking back, so you said they they were looking for a vocalist, and I know at the time that wasn't something that you specialized in right. or practiced. Like looking back, do you think you, you could have participated as a vocalist? Uh I, I don't think my level of Spanish was good enough, or I don't think I could have uh, gotten the accent uh, close enough to really have pulled that off. So, plus it wasn't really something I'd even considered at the time. Uh, uh, I mean, I was 60 years old before I ever sang in front of another living soul knowingly. So, uh, <laughs> so that this is all kind of new for me still. Very, very good. Um, and just moving into the music theme a, a little bit more. How did music help you to just reinvent yourself in, in general? So give you maybe a different feeling or, or different perception of, of yourself? Uh, I've always been a big music lover. And, um, you know, when I was in the car by myself, you know, I'd be singing with the radio turned up a full blast, you know, but, but never in front of anybody else. Yeah. One of the groups that I practice with, which also never really never really came to anything we never really actually started performing but the the person trying to sing the lead on one song was having problems hitting a couple of the notes and and they asked me hey do you, you want to give it a try and I'm like, you know who me <laughs> so but but i i did and uh you know i kind of choked kind of choked down my natural uh fear of that sort of thing and i did it and they they seemed to like what i was doing but you know that that ended kind of uh, uh that ended kind of abruptly and and maybe a year or so down the road i was contacted by by two of the different members of that of that initial group and uh and and those ended up being like uh, uh two of the key people in the bands that i've been in where we've actually done live performances and it's really allowed me to explore you know the side of me that that does love music and 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 there's a lot of satisfaction from knowing that people enjoy what we so if, if someone's musically minded 
would you suggest that as a as a potential outlet here in, in, oh, in Cuenca ab- with the different open mics and stuff? Absolutely, there are there are endless opportunities for people who are into music here, uh, and people to play music, uh, want to listen to music. Um, this is quite the opposite. When I was at, uh, when I was in Manta, there was exactly one expat band. And, um, and it, well, there was one expat in the band, <laughs> but, uh, but there was, this wasn't a music scene down there, which was, uh, I, I, it was very disappointing for me, but, but here you just about any night of the week, there's a different uh, group playing, whether it's an expat band or an Ecuadorian or, or, uh, or a visiting band from another country. I mean, there, there's just endless opportunities here to enjoy music either as a performer or as a, and as a fan. Maybe even if you, you don't even know that you're into music, you know, maybe Maybe a starting off point is the drum circle. How, yeah. how you started, you know, many years ago as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I had only been here about three weeks. I brought down uh, three djembes <laughs> in my suitcase and um, started a drum circle and uh, and pretty much kept it going for six, seven, eight years. Um, uh, again, time and other commitments kind of. Uh, Kind of limited my my ability to uh, to lead uh, the circles. Uh, they actually do them at Idiom Art now on uh, uh, maybe every maybe every couple of months or so. Uh, so I still come to those. I, I still enjoy it. Yeah, awesome. And just moving on to some sort of reflection uh, type scenarios. So you've been in Ecuador for quite a while now. How has your general perception of of Ecuador changed this time, especially at the moment? You know, we, we, you've seen the news all mm. around the world with the different headlines around security and stuff like that. So I don't want to just go down that security path, but that is one example of things that may have changed mm-hmm. um, during your time. Well, yeah, that's definitely um, that's probably the you know the saddest part of for me that uh, um, you know that kind of vacuum that was created in the pandemic sort of allowed a lot of. Uh, different things to develop here and and you know increased crime levels and uh, you know gang violence especially on the on the coast and I mean I still consider Cuenca a fairly safe city but I but I'm definitely a lot more careful when I'm you know I, I don't hesitate to walk wherever I want to walk but but uh, I'm, I'm a lot more cautious than I used to be I mean uh, Cuenca was a very innocent city when I first got here 10 years ago and now not so much um but um but i still love it here uh it's i mean it's an amazingly beautiful country um um you know biologically and and uh, diverse and the plants and everything and i mean there's still a lot of it i've not seen yet but um but but yeah i, I still love ecuador um i'm and i still have you know i'm i'm, I'm kind of an, the eternal optimist so i keep hoping that things are going to reverse and be like they were and you know knock on wood sure sure and so obviously you know you're not going anywhere but were there any times where you did consider leaving and what sort of uh, what was driving that well, one of the things that I think a lot of expats struggle with here is uh, missing their family members in the U.S. I mean, I, I have I have four children, ten grandchildren in the U.S., and uh, there's always a bit of uh, you know, there's always a sort of tinge of uh, of guilt about not being there for them all the time. I mean, I, I I try to communicate with them as much as I can and try to get back as often as I can, but that's uh, uh, that's the one thing that's made me you know think about maybe maybe I should think about moving back but you know I've uh, one of my daughters and uh, well my daughter and one of my sons have been down here to visit and they understand completely after seeing my life here how much different it is how much I've grown um, uh, how much it's just done for me personally uh, in so many ways they're, they're like all for it now I say you stay there <laughs> that's great that's great that they're supportive yeah. do, do they visit by chance uh, well, my youngest son's been here once, and my daughter's been here twice, uh, and they'd both live here if they could. And, but uh, and work situation makes it more, and family situations make it difficult. So, no, absolutely. But I also, I've heard from several expats that have basically said the same thing that yeah, they miss their their grandkids in particular. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then, uh, 
kind of funny in a way, but they, they would go back, you know, make the effort, move back to, to the States to be closer to the grandkids. But then the grandkids basically give some sort of response like, you're smothering me. <laughs> you know, like, I, I love you and I love spending time with you, but, you know, maybe holidays uh, are sort of where it's at. And so some right. expats have actually come back after that because they're a little bit disappointed with that. Have you experienced anything like that? So no, not yet. Well, I mean, I actually experienced that before I moved here. I mean, um, all of my children are grown and have children, you know, grown children of their, of their own and, and just finding time to get together with them all. Uh, I mean, it's, it's like you said, uh, you know, holidays, uh, special events, uh, you know, a summer picnic, something like that. Uh, other than that, you know, they, you know, they have lives of their own, so it's just not always easy to get together. So I, I probably see them almost as much from here as I did when I lived there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good. And like looking back, is there some aspect of, you know, let's call it this transformation that the reinvention that, that really surprised you? Um, probably mostly, mostly the, uh, the music aspect uh i mean i never in, in a million years would have imagined myself being part of a band uh let alone actually singing lead vocals on different songs and things like that i mean just it it still kind of blows my mind that i i've gotten to that point because it's just something i never would have considered uh i had a bad experience with a with a junior high school music teacher where mm. he put me on the spot and and that just kind of shot my uh any desire i ever had to uh to be openly musical in front of other people so um but but yeah that's that's one of the things that's really surprised me and uh and it has become a passion of mine. That's that's really kind of one of my, my main focus these days is focusing on music. And Jeff, if there was one piece of advice that you could give to your younger self before you've moved to Ecuador, what would that be? It would be to not wait to, the, you know, if, if, if you have the means and um, and you're able to get away, come here as soon as you can because... Uh, uh, you know, I was able to come here at age about 56, 57 because I had a military retirement and that just barely covered the minimum pension requirements. So, um, but um, uh, I, you I, know, I, I've heard this from a bunch of expats, but you know, working is for suckers. <laughs> so if, if you come down here and start enjoying your retirement at, a, retirement at an earlier age, uh, I highly recommend that. And that's, uh, that's what I probably would have been here a few years earlier if, if I, um, if somebody had given me that advice. Just giving you a bit of a nudge a few yeah. years beforehand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's really good. Especially if you're saying, you know, your effective cost of living is a third. Oh, yeah. That, that, that really means that you, you, you can retire early under most mm -hmm. circumstances. So, that's, that's really good mm -hmm. advice. And the, the very last question is just looking forward. What, what, what challenges um, lie ahead for you and, and what goals do you still want to achieve here in, in Cuenca and Ecuador in general? Well, some of the challenges uh, was as I already related. I've had I've had a <laughs> I've had a string of health challenges. I, um, uh, again, it's a good thing I'm an optimist because <laughs> you know I I keep you know I I believe things will will continue to get better. But uh, and regarding some of my future goals, uh, well, I've um, <laughs> again with the, with the music. Um, I wasn't satisfied just doing percussion and vocals. I decided, uh, especially when, when the lockdown, when the COVID lockdown hit, uh, I, I managed to get my hands on an old guitar and started uh, using YouTube uh, videos to try and teach myself. And I'm not very good, <laughs> but I, I but I'm I'm getting better. Uh, my goal is to eventually get to a point where I can, you know, accompany myself and maybe do some open mics or, yeah, it'll, it'll broaden my opportunities in terms of, uh, you know, staying involved with the music scene here. And I, I, I've since bought a, a mandolin and a ukulele and, uh, and some harmonicas. So now I, um, I, I, I play poorly on a number of, of instruments, <laughs> but, uh, but I keep working on them. And, uh, and it sounds like music brings you the most joy at oh, this yeah. stage of your life. Yeah. So you're going to explore that more by the sounds of yeah, it. Yeah, it's definitely a passion of mine, one that I uh, intend to keep pursuing.
as yeah. long as I can. Awesome, Jeff. Well, thank you very much for your time today. I've got a lot of value out of our chat and I'm sure our audience has as well. Uh, but if someone wants to get in touch with you, what's mm -hmm. the best way for, for them to do that? Through your Facebook group or, or something else? Yeah, probably through uh, my Facebook book, uh, Facebook group, the Expats Without Agendas. Uh, they can message, message me there or, um, um, or if they have my phone number, they can WhatsApp me. <laughs> awesome. Um, thank you very much for your time. Today. Oh, thank you for having me. Super. And remember, if you do want to make a donation to one of Quaker's deserving nonprofits, feel free to do so on our website. I'll provide the link in the description. You likely already know that Yapa Tree has a very active real estate business, so feel free to get in contact if you're in the market to rent or buy. And thanks a million for watching. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this new podcast format. Do feel free to email me, jason at yapatree.com. Ciao, ciao.